What's up guys, Brett here, and today she is gonna be spilling the beans on how much doctors earn in the UK. We're gonna be going over all of her pay slips to see how much she has earned for every year that she's worked as a doctor, and I know that I was surprised to see how much you were earning. Were you really? Yeah, watch to find out. Okay, so this is Evie, she's a doctor in ophthalmology, and she's also my wife. I've mentioned her in a few of my other videos, so now you can put a face to the phrase, my wife. Yeah, my name is Evie Clay, I'm an SUN in ophthalmology, and I'm currently earning 3,000 pounds a month after tax. We were gonna leave that until the end. Oh, whoops. Okay, never mind. So she earns £3,000 a month right now, but in this video, we're gonna go through all of the different stages of her training to see how much she's been earning since day one. I should really watch all your other videos to see what you say about me, shouldn't I? Okay guys, so in this video, we're gonna cover the pay scales for doctors in England and the components of an NHS pay slip, as well as? As well as how much I earn as an F1, so a house officer, my first year out of uni, as an F2, my second year out of uni, and a medical officer, and then my third year overall working as a doctor, currently as an ST1 in ophthalmology. So for her first year out of uni, she did three different jobs. In her second year, she did another three different jobs. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna look at how much she was earning for each of those jobs or each of those rotations yep. to see the difference between year one, year two, as well as the individual jobs within those years. All right, so for the duration of this video, I'm gonna ask you to explain everything as if you were talking to a five-year-old, because one, you basically are, mm -hmm. and number two, because it can be really difficult to understand the language or the way that doctors speak sometimes, so let's just keep it simple. Okay, so first up, tell us what ophthalmology is as if you were talking to a five-year-old. So it's a medical specialty where I am a doctor of the eyes. There you go, nice and simple. Okay, so let's go over what the internet says is the average pay for each stage of being a doctor, and then compare it to EVs and see what the difference actually is. Yep, so the first thing we're going to do is just bring up the BMA website and see what the pay scales are for junior doctors in the UK. So you can see here on the BMA website, there are nodal points at which basic pay increases. So starting with an F1 at £28,000, um, it goes up slightly uh, when you become an F2 at £32,700 so a year. So F1 is your first year out of uni. So yep. your first year out of uni, you study for five years? Yep, so you've studied for five years in uni. Five years in uni, first year out of uni, you're earning £28,000. Yes. Okay, and then your yep. second year, you're earning 32700 And then? And then after that, you go into your core or specialty training program. So you're either an ST1, which stands for specialty training, or a CT1 or 2, which stands for core training. Um, but that's basically the same level. Um, and at that point, your nodal point or your nodal pay is £38,700 a year. So that's your starting pay. After that, you become a junior registrar, so ST3 to 5 or CT3 and above. You start off at £49,000 a year. And then the more senior you get, the more you earn. So from ST6 to 8, it's £52,000 as a starting point. Okay, so just knowing how much you earn, I already know that that's not accurate because you earn more than that already. Exactly, yeah, but like I said, it's because this is only the starting pay. On top of that, you have to add all your other on calls that you do, the nights, all the extra kind of um, unsocial hours that you do as well. All right, so we'll be covering all of those points in this video, but for now, they're the basic rates that people get paid according to the BMA website. Now let's check her pay slips to see how much she actually gets paid. And actually, in my experience, I find that doctors don't often look into their pay slips properly at the end of the month. Um, and I would have really appreciated, I think, when I was starting out, someone sitting me down to tell me what the components of an NHS payslip are, and I would have really looked into it a bit better. Yeah, and we actually spoke about this a few years ago, where, from my point of view anyway, it seems like doctors just accept that the NHS is this almighty system, you're in it, you don't question it, you just go with the flow, you sort of, you get placed wherever you're placed, you work the hours that you're told, and you just go with the flow, basically. Is that fair? Um, I mean, it's a difficult system to be in, but at the end of the day, I think doctors go into it because they do genuinely want to help people. Um, and going with the flow may sometimes be a part of it. So there is a lot of trust in the system, but because of your influence on me, I think I've made the effort to really look more into my pay slip and understand it a bit better. In terms of placements, it really depends on how well you do throughout medical school and then your interview uh, application process as well. But that's definitely one of the downsides of working as a doctor in the UK, um, kind of finding that work-life balance is a bit difficult sometimes. Yeah, there you go. And I completely agree. As the husband of someone who works as a doctor in the, in the NHS, let me tell you that work-life balance sucks. If you want any sort of solid structure in terms of where you live, your working hours coming home for your, to your family or anything like that, you basically can't have it. Okay, so moving on to the juicy stuff then, the components of an NHS payslip. I've got one of Evie's payslips here and I'm just gonna pull that up and go through it. So you've okay. got your base pay. Yeah. How, what's your base pay? So that's the main chunk of our pay. So mm -hmm. we get paid that for up to 40 hours a week on our rostered time. Rostered time, but then yeah. you've got additional rosters hours here. So what are they? Yeah, so that's the amount that we get paid above 40 hours up to 48 hours. So an extra eight hours at the base pay rate. So is that overtime? It's not necessarily overtime, it's just the amount of hours that we're down for on our roster. 
In your contract? Yeah, I know. So you you get paid for 48 hours at a standard rate every week? Yes, yeah. Okay, Unless so you're working less than full time, then you're working a few hours a week. Okay. So then if you work over 48 hours a week? Um, then you get paid like supplemental hours, okay. whereas like a, at a higher rate. So just to clarify then, okay. I used to work an office job in London while Evie worked this job. My office hours were actually longer than Evie's on paper. Yeah. And I would often get home earlier than you because you were still working. So if you worked an extra few hours every day over yeah. the 48, yeah. do you get paid for that? No, unless you are rostered for it. So for example, if I had to stay late after 5 p.m. because I had a sick patient to look after, I don't get paid extra for those two hours that I'm still at work. That doesn't make sense. I mean, no, I mean, I it, make, it makes sense that in a private company, like yeah. where I was working, I mean, you might work those extra hours because you're going for a promotion or you're going for anything like that. Mm. But in the NHS, working extra hours for free is not going to get you anywhere. You're not going to progress to the next year or the next training post faster no. because there's a system. So yeah, that's where true. Just down there. I mean, it doesn't happen every day, but on the chance that, you know, you do, <laughs> you do have a patient who does need you and there's no one else that can take over from you, even though there should be, but sometimes the on-call person is really busy as well and they can't help you there and then. And there's just some jobs that have run over from the day team into the night team and it just doesn't make sense for the next team to then take them over because it's, right. just, it's just difficult for them. All right. So you have to stay behind and do that and you know you're not going to get paid for it, but what you can do is then bring it up with your team kind of in the future, the next day, or the next few days, if this keeps happening, and then they can then kind of get an extra person to help you in the daytime, or you can get a day off in lieu as well. Does that make sense? Sounds crazy to me, but there you go. Some, <laughs> some sort of doctor insight, I suppose, that I don't have. That's how it works. We also have a weekend allowance, so this is a fixed bonus to compensate for working on the weekends, and the amount paid depends on how often our weekend duty is required. So for example, you get paid more if you're working one and two weekends as opposed to one and four, or five or six weekends. So that's your weekend one, okay. Yeah. And then you've also got your London zone? Yeah, so that's an additional however much a month. So in my case, it was 180 pounds, um, just because we're working within London, because they accept that working in London comes with higher costs of living as well. But I mean, they... based on the cost of living in London, 180 pounds is not gonna cover the difference. No, it really... That's probably not even gonna cover your transport or your commute, is it? Yeah, it, it mostly covered my tube fare. The tube fare is pretty expensive mm. um, and petrol as well. But that depends driving. on where you live as well because some people commute into London and then they take the tube to yeah. the final destination. So Exactly, so it really yeah. depends, but it's just an extra bit to kind of tide you over, I suppose. If you're doing nights as well, on the pace that what comes up is enhanced rate hours. So these are the night rates um, and they're an additional 37% increase from our base pay per mm. hour. For any antisocial hours that you work, yeah? Yeah, for any antisocial hours. And the antisocial hours are 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. and they used to be 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And I'm sure as a frugal husband, you can imagine what my thoughts on that are. Once you reach specialty training, I have trouble saying specialty. <laughs> so specialty training is your third year in training, yeah? Yes. So not year one, not year two, your third year. Third year in training. Then? Um, you get extra pay for your on-call availability. So okay. this is um, when you can be at home, but then you need to be available over the phone or you need to be available to come in from work, from home to work. Yeah, all right, on-call um, availability. Yeah, exactly. Right. So guys, there are the components of a basic not a basic, they're the components of an NHS payslip. Um, let me know what you think about it in the comments. Drop me a comment saying what you think. Um, Evie will be answering some of these comments as well. Yeah. And we'll definitely get back to you. Okay, so if you don't mind, in a minute, we're gonna pull up Evie's payslips and we're gonna show them on the screen. We're gonna have a look at exactly how much she's been earning throughout her years working as a doctor. Yep, so as an F1, I worked in the gastroenterology. That's the first year out of uni. Yep, so my first year out of uni, I worked in gastroenterology, orthopedics, and an infectious diseases job. I just wanna clarify that you worked those jobs separately, so you had three rotations, right? Yeah, so we each rotation is four months each and we just kind of rotate through these different specialties. Okay, so you weren't year. working three jobs at the same time, you were working one, then the other, then the other. No, it's just so that we get exposure to kind of a huge range of specialties. Okay, all right, let's pull up the pay slips and see how much you were earning. Yeah, okay, so this is my orthopedic pay slip, which I earned, which I took home 2,266 pounds a month after tax. And this is my infectious diseases pay slip, and I took home 2,248 pounds a month after tax. So they're very similar. What about the other yeah, one? Yeah, pretty much the same. Uh, for my gastroenterology job, I actually didn't save a pay slip because these are e pay slips. Oh, okay. But it was the same. All right. Yeah. And then in my F2 year, I also had three rotations. So I did GP, AE, and cardiology. Have you got your pay slips for all of these? Yeah. So in my GP job, I earned 1,945 pounds a month. That's after less, tax. isn't it? It's less than F1. It is less, but that's because I worked less. I didn't do any weekends. I didn't do any okay. nights. But in my opinion, to be honest, it was worth it to work less and earn a bit less as well. Mm, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. I know you disagree with that, but it's because you can do locums to, to make up that difference. Yeah, all right, fair enough. 
So 1,945, which is less than the F1, yeah. but it's because you work less, okay? And then? Exactly. And then my A&E job, so you can see here, I earn 2,678 right, pounds a, a month. More. It was a bit more. Um, and then finally my cardiology job where I earn 2,553 pounds a month. Five. So that's like, on average, you're earning an extra 350 pounds a week, a month. Yeah. So that's like 4,004 and a half grand a year, which is a pretty good pay rise considering yeah. that you're coming straight out of uni and then you're getting from year one to year two. It's not too bad. All right, so have you got any of your pay slips for your current job, your ST1? I do. Okay, let me bring that one up too. Bear in mind, guys, that she's not going to be getting her London waiting anymore because uh, before Evie started this job, we actually moved out of London. So mm. would you expect it to be less? Let's have a look. Uh, so this is my pay slip from it. I got £3,300 that month and this was after tax. So it was a fair bit more yeah. than working as an F2. And that's because you're now in specialty training, Yeah, right? exactly. Okay. All right then guys, so for the last section of this video, I'm just gonna ask Evie a few questions, a few questions that you guys might have. Um, so I'm just gonna ask you some questions. Number one, how easy is it to earn extra money working as a doctor? If you just want some extra income, how easy is it to go out there and get that? Um, generally pretty easy. So even as I was working in um, A&E as an F2, I did pick up a few locum shifts as well. Mm -hmm. um, in London, the, the amount of amount of money you get paid per hour is capped though. So that's like 45 pounds, 40, 40 pounds an hour to be expected really if you're oh, okay. working as an F2. But what if you're working in London and you happen to be in Scotland for whatever reason, can you get a job in Scotland and earn a few extra quid there? You can, you can. I know people do travel to Scotland sometimes and further up north to get higher pay, higher mm. locum pays. Um, and people are comfortable with that, but for me, it's just a, another unfamiliar environment. I, I haven't done that personally, but I know people who do, and it can be very lucrative. Okay, all right, second question then. Say you had an opportunity to start a business. Yeah. So you needed more time than you could afford in your spare time to work on this business. Yeah. How easy is it to quit your job, but still be able to work and earn these locum shifts to sort of keep the cash flow up, sort of have some money coming in to pay the bills? Um, so I think what you're talking about is an f 3 year. So basically what I mean by that is after an F1 and F2, so your kind of foundation training, and before you go into specialty training, you can take a few years out, and a lot of people do do that. Mm -hmm. um, they locum for a little bit, they choose as and when they want to work. Okay, so it's pretty easy in, yeah, it, uh, yeah. in that year, but what if you wanted to do it in your after your F1 or at any point in your training? Generally, once you're already in a training program, you need a really good excuse to take some time out of it, whether it's to be with your family or spend time looking after a loved one. Like, you need a good reason for that. Yeah, you can't right. just say, oh, I need a break. No, that makes sense. All right, so last question then. If you could start all over, would you choose to be a doctor? It is an amazing job. It's got great opportunities but... to help people and you interact with all your patients and you, and you form relationships with them. Mm -hmm. it, and you know, you get to make a difference in people's lives. Sure. It's great. I love it. But you at the same time... The question. <laughs> <laughs> it, ev everything comes at a price. Mm. It's, it's a lot of work to get through uni as a, as a medical student. And then once you're working, sometimes you can feel undervalued. Yeah, I think the opportunity of... cost of all that studying, to be honest, like I only yeah. studied for three years and I still feel like I lost out on a lot. The opportunity cost of that studying was quite significant. So yeah. to go through five years doing medicine, mm -hmm. even more so. But come yeah. on, yes or no. If you had the opportunity again, would you still be a doctor? Yes, I would. Yes, All, right. I would. <laughs> All right then guys, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. I know this one was a little bit different. I hope you enjoyed meeting Evie. And um, yep, yeah, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. See Cheers. you guys next time.